And we're back with the Hammer Podcast. That's right, friends. That's right. Hammerheads all across the fruited plain. We are back in the saddle and ready to roll here at the Excellence in Pastoral Broadcasting Network. Brought to you from sunny Lynchburg, Virginia. That's right, friends. It's soon to be summer, so I'm sure ever all of our hammerheads are getting ready to swim in the pools or go out to the lake. So enjoy yourself. But today we wanted to continue slash conclude our conversation on taxes. When will taxes end? Well, they're going to end at least in conversation today. So, you know, a few words on that. Let's let's kind of wrap up what we've said in regards to taxes and, you know, how, you know, what, what a Christian should think about being in the public square. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we did, we have discussed taxes. Obviously, there's more we could say. We don't claim to be the experts uh, That's on right. taxes, That's right. and we hope none of our hammerheads have... Uh, understood us to say, I think, you know, we've had a few hammerheads joke around with us in the hallways of the church and say, oh, good, you know, I heard the podcast, we don't have to pay taxes. <laughs> uh, and of course, they say it kind of tongue in cheek. Um, but we yeah, said, we, we'll bring we them a meal in jail. We'll bring right. you a meal in jail. That's right. We certainly have not said uh, uh, that you don't have to or should not pay taxes, but hopefully we've talked about, uh, we've talked about the issue enough to get us thinking and thinking through a biblical uh, framework. Well, that's right. right. Well, with half our theological brains tied behind our backs, I mean, we can make a complicated issue clear, especially for all the Arminians out there that are confused about taxes. Here at the Hammer Podcast, we've made the issue at least clear yes. for all those who would like yes, to think Arminians about it. The Arminians may not agree with us about eternal security, but I'm pretty sure they agree with us about taxes. That's right. And they're taxed too much. That's right. Now, so... Just in time, uh, one of our hammerheads sent us. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, sent us a very interesting document. I haven't had time to fact check this, uh, and that's always a little bit dangerous. But, uh, but, but Rand Paul, and I think he does this yearly. Yes, yes, is this I think right, so. Uh, puts out. Yeah, and, it's called uh, the the Festivus Report. Yeah, not to be confused with Seinfeld. Well, yeah, I was going to say they Festivus Maximus. Yes. Or, Maximus Festivus, whatever Festivus it was. Festivus for is. the rest I, of us, yeah. Yeah, there you go. I wonder if they have feats of strength in the Festivus report, it could, right? I think so. But yeah, so he did. We we got this Festivus report talking about, you know, government waste right. in taxes. Right, how the taxes are wasted. And and we'll, we'll give the number that's in that report. In fact, all of you can, can go look it up. And again, you know, you, you'll have to do your own fact-checking on this. Um, I did very little fact-checking on it because I didn't have time. Uh, but what I did look up was what has been said about Rand Paul's, th- the reports he's done in previous years. Right. Um, and those have have stood the test of fact-checking. So based on that track record, I feel comfortable giving this number, and then, again, people have to look at it. But uh, one thing we do know is our tax money is absolutely wasted. Yeah, it's we, here it is. I found the we, I found the specific right, and, number. And we've been talking about that. So give us this number. And hammerheads, make sure, make sure you're holding on because you might fall over when you hear this. That's number. right. If you're up on a ladder doing some work, please, friend, get off the ladder. Sit down. Take a sip of uh, cold ice water or coffee. That's right. All right. That number is nine hundred billion dollars. That's Whoa. right. Nine hundred billion dollars. Right. So that would be a hundred billion dollars shy of a trillion dollars wasted. That's crazy. And now remind let's remind ourselves, friends, this is from two thousand and twenty three. Yeah. More things have happened, and in as of late, our current debt is upwards of the tunes of thirty four trillion dollars here yeah. in the good old US of A. And so just the interest payment right. on that. Is probably going to be like a trillion dollars, right? Yeah, that's right. For this year, that's exactly it's the right. The interest payment, and why? Why are we in debt to begin with? Because of years and years of wasted tax dollar money. That's right. Which again, the number for this year 
averaging it out, okay, it, nine hundred billion, folks. Billion, that's right. Billion dollars. That. That's tax money wasted. So you might remember uh, that we we had said uh, in the last couple of weeks that there's the issue is not that there's not enough tax money. Mm-hmm. In other words, if if anyone ever hears our government say we have to tax people more because we don't have enough tax money coming in, that is not true. That yeah. is not true at all. They have more than enough coming in uh, to take care of our borders and everything else. They have more than enough money coming in. They waste it. Yep. And uh, so, you know, when many of you have the same experience I had, you know, this past year where all of a sudden, whoa, what do you mean, you know, normally we got some money back? Mm -hmm. And I guess because I have one child to claim now, only one, I need to— Need to start adopting some children out there, right? Yeah, that's but, right. That's right. But I only have one to claim now, and I guess as a result of that, uh, plus Bidenomics, uh, lo and behold, I find out I owed a little more than fifteen hundred dollars this year. Yeah. Whereas in most years, uh, you know, we again got some money back. It used to be whatever we got back, we would just put right into savings, and that would be whatever if we went over our monthly budget. You know? Right. Um, now, we, we there is none of that. Uh, again, thanks to uh, Bidenomics, but yes. it's been happening way before that. But, but, th- but Bidenomics this is, the point. is so great. Don't I don't know why you right. got to be yeah. so mean on Bidenomics. There's not grocery store prices are safe and normal. Everything's good. Right. That's right. Now, some people hear this and say, "Ah, you know, so what? The deficit keeps going up." Yes, but it, it's like a volcano that has all the signs of erupting, Mm -hmm. and you just ignore it and ignore it. Sooner or later, that thing's erupting. Right. When you've got the BRICS nations, right, in the Southern Hemisphere working to get off the petrodollar because of some of the different movements that have happened, you know, in the past four years of the Biden regime, right? I mean, that that could shift things for America in a very, you know, dramatic way. Yeah, no, th- absolutely. If absolutely. people were to stop trading in the petro US dollar. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, but the getting back to our taxes, right? Again, it, it goes back to what we've said. They're just they're absolutely being wasted. And so that means we we should uh, as believers, we should be aware of this number one. Again, it's remarkable how many believers are not aware of it. Yeah, it really is. I mean, I was talking to someone, the amount of unregistered Christians, right, yeah. unregistered to vote, you know, in America is staggering. And I mean, if you're not registered to vote, you're clearly not paying attention because you right. don't care to engage on this topic. Right. Right. And and, and the waste is real. The, the excessive taxes are real and they're problematic. Right. And, and it does ultimately affect the gospel. Yes. And that's what I try to get through to people. I think a lot of people think, well, no, you know, we just we render unto Caesar. Yeah. Doesn't it? Well, it, Not it, our does, kingdom. it does affect. Okay. Because the more taxes God's people have to pay, the less they have to give to the church, right? To 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 give to missions, mm-hmm. uh, to give to the proliferation of the gospel. Yeah. That's I mean, those exactly are just right. the facts. You know, as it is, we have plenty of professing believers who don't give to the church, don't give back to the Lord as it is when right. they can. And, you know, God will, you know, God will deal with them in his own way because that's disobedience, right? But you already have that. And then you have those who are good, obedient, cheerful givers uh, and give to where it's a sacrifice, um, like the Bible says, right, um, and uh, they're being taxed more, so yeah. so they have less to give. So so it is it, it. So that's why I get a little edgy when people say, "Well, taxes taxes have nothing to do with the gospel." Mm-hmm. Well, I, yeah, they do. Yeah, when you think about it in this way, it does. Yeah. Well, it, even the inflation has something to do with the gospel advancing because that's the hidden tax. Mm-hmm. Right, so that you got the overt tax of we yeah. take money away from your paycheck, but then inflation is saying the money that you have left can buy less things because it's worth the dollar doesn't right. go as far, right? So both of these things are affecting our ability to spend money to advance the gospel. Well, sure, right? Yeah, I mean, I was just reading something the other day where it was saying that the average American 
is paying since Biden took over. We'll say the last four years, right? Grandpa. Is, is paying 20% more. The average American is paying 20% more for car insurance. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's just car insurance. That's just car insurance, right? So, But this is what you're talking about with the inflation is, okay, you take your money. Mm-hmm. And even if you had the same amount as you had four years ago in your paycheck, yeah. it, it's not worth that what it was. Right. right. I saw a statistic about McDonald's hamburgers from like yes. the, the teens, like 2020, 2015 yeah. till now. And the prices are ridiculous. You can't, there's no dollar happy meal type of thing anymore. Yeah. You know, because your dollars yeah. don't go as far as they used yeah, now, to. Yeah, now it's the $5 unhappy meal. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I can't even eat it. I know I'm putting junk into my body, and I'm paying too much money for it. Yeah, that's right. The quarter pounder. Mind, yeah, I didn't mind paying a dollar, you know, for heart disease. <laughs> but paying $5 for heart disease really bothers me. That's right. We know um, we know most of our hammerheads, they don't, they don't even venture to McDonald's. But if you were to venture to McDonald's. They're probably all healthy vegan. Yeah. <laughs> Vegans. No, no, they buy chicken from God's chicken, Chick Fil A, because it's evangelism. That's right. It's evangelism. That's holy chicken. Amen. But I, you know, but but that's what we're talking about, right? So people go to the grocery store. I mean, you go anywhere, you see what you're paying yeah. for stuff, and it is just absolutely unbelievable, yeah. right? And all, and what I'm saying is, and this is why we're talking about this whole issue, right? All of this does ultimately have a gospel impact. Yeah, that's right. And to to not see it that way, I think, is to be naive and not connect dots that we ought to be connecting. That's right. And, and, then, to, and then to try and hide behind an eschatological system, right? Right. And say, oh, well, this is our view. This is not our kingdom. We shouldn't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Right. You know, this is the, the point we've been trying to make, that it, regardless of which eschatological system you have, exactly. Christians should be awake and aware of what's happening around us and engaging on these topics. Right, and that's really what we've tried to bring out in this series. Obviously, in this series, we went into some pretty good depth on exegesis. One would say seminary-level depth yeah, I, on eschatology, maybe yeah, even and, greater well, than even, seminary. And even to get that, you would have to have a, a specific class in seminary on eschatology. Yes. If you just take your basic theological classes and such, you're not even going to get into the depth the nitty gritty that we did with with some of the passages, yeah. right? You know, so, I, one was thinking that maybe yeah. we should even give out a certificate for some of the hammerheads that have been through our whole course on eschatology. They could get a certificate <laughs> of completion, but there we will we'll hold that go. for a, a future episode. Yeah, yeah, we'll but, see how much we can charge them for that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. So, you know. So, but our whole point here was. No matter what your eschatological views, and mm-hmm. we wanted you to be educated, that's why we went through the exegesis. Right. Um, but we were trying to prove that, okay, at the end of the day now, Mr. and Mrs. Premillennial, mm-hmm. we'll even say Mr. and Mrs. Historical Premillennial are sitting down, Mr. and Mrs. Dismissational uh, Premillennial are sitting down, Mr. and Mrs. Amillennial are sitting down, right? Mr. and Mrs. Post-Millennial. They're standing up. We'll even say they're standing. They're standing. They're standing. That's right. They're going to take this room over. We better beware of them. That's right. Uh, no. Wait, wait. Is that someone I, knocking at the door? No, no. That was uh, just... Yeah. No. yeah. So uh, that was... I think that was somebody from Moscow. They yeah. Said Doug Wilson has a message for us. <laughs> That's right. That's uh, right. He might come in here. If he starts pouring gasoline all over our table to light it up, we know we've got a problem. We know it's November. Uh, no, quarter right. November. no quarter November. That's um, right. So, <laughs> right... So the point is, our point was that we're here in the public square together, Mm -hmm. and our particular eschatological view should not change our engagement in these issues in the public square. Mm -hmm. Even if, right, and so I want to rehash this to tie it all together a little bit, all right, even if a post-millennialist Thinks and not all of them because there are different varieties of post millennialism. But even if they think, hey, we would really love to see a a we're, we're gonna we we would love to see a Christian nation and 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 th- this is in fact our calling mm-hmm. to try to bring this about as much as we can. All that okay and and hey, we are very positive because man, we're gonna you know 
uh, the world's going to become Christianized, not just the United States, mm-hmm. but the world's going to become Christianized because Christians in every nation should be doing what we're doing, and the gospel's going to work to a degree that not everybody will become saved, but it's going to be... Have a great influence. <coughs> okay, that's great. Yeah. Fine. Now, you might say, so then logically it makes sense that I'm here fighting for things in the Christian square. Yeah, right. That would be the, the logical flow, right? they would say. Um, and, and I get that. But again, this is where we began, because there's some younger folks who really don't know much about the exegesis. That's why we went through the exegesis mm-hmm. uh, of eschatology. But they say, that's where I am. I'm one of them. I don't even really know how to defend or think about postmillennialism through Scripture. Now you do, because you've listened to these podcasts. Yes, you've been certified by the Hammer podcast, that's right. Eschatological But Studies. before you didn't. Yes. But now you've been enlightened. We didn't even charge you anything. See that? That's right. Now, Spreading good cheer to all the world. That's right. That's what we do. We're just, well, we can't help it. We're just uh, kind gentlemen. Yeah, we're but, cheerful. So, but they're looking and saying, but, but we like the fact that you're not just sitting back with all this wokeness and all this stuff. You're, you're standing up and you're trying to do something. Yes. And I feel like I should do something. I might not even know exactly what to do or how to do it, but I should do something. Yeah. And you guys are doing it, and I think you're doing it because you're post-millennial, therefore I'm post-millennial, right? Yes, that's it, yes. That's been the whole point, the whole reason. We're, we're trying to show you, as much as we respect Moscow and Doug Wilson and so forth, uh, they do have some certainly theological issues with dunking the babies and such that <laughs> We would take baptism to babies. Oh, yeah. Lord's Supper to babies. Right. Um, Now, having said that, right, our our point is that you don't have to go there Mm -hmm. to be involved. Because even if you are, even if you are premillennial, and even if you're dispensational premillennial, but even an amillennialist would agree that the Bible says the world's going to get worse before Christ comes back. Right. So what we're saying is, Okay, yeah. The the Bible also says God has his elect. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to that, we agree we should preach the gospel because that's the means. Right. Believing okay? goes by hearing and hearing right. by the word of God. So if we know, so I'm just saying let's be consistent, right? So what? We believe, we think the world's going to get worse before Christ comes back. All right. Does Does that mean... We're now here in the public square, and we just don't do anything. No, mm-hmm. I, I'm saying we should have the same perspective, right, of the post millennialist to where we're, we're in the here and now. Uh, now we might think it's going to result in something different, right? The post millennialist might think this is going to result in uh, a Christianized nation, and the pre millennialist, amillennialist might say, "Well, no, it's not going to result in a Christianized nation," but. In the here and now, in the time God has me, I'm going to do what I can to be the most positive influence and to do everything I can for for the gospel to get out mm-hmm. because I know I'll stand before the Lord one day and I'm called to be faithful in whatever situation he's put me in. And I know Acts 17, verse 26. Mm-hmm. I know God's providential. And so I know he put me right here at this specific place, this specific geographical boundary yeah. with this specific era time, yeah, that's for such right. a time as this. And I'm saying that should be our mindset. So from that standpoint, the post-millennialist and pre-millennialist should be in the public square having that same mindset. Yeah. Well, and then, you know, to have the... To say, oh, Christ is coming back, it's all going to get terrible in the end, so we're just going to sit back and wait... That's what they were doing in Thessalonians, and Paul comes in and says, whoa, 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 you know, you've missed the whole point. If you don't work, you don't eat. Yeah. Right? And so there's a level at which, okay, we could say, oh, it's all going to get terrible, so we're just going to sit on our hands and do nothing. So you wouldn't do that with your family. You wouldn't just stop working. Yeah. So your family can't eat. You wouldn't provide a house. You say, oh, well, it's all going to end anyway, so right. there's no need for me to do any tending to my family, no need for me to raise my children, because... The end is near. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we don't know that they necessarily were thinking, like the premillennialists today, that the world's only going to get worse. Uh, but we do know they absolutely were thinking, well, Christ is going to come back. Right. And therefore, why should I work? 
Right. Why, why should, should I do this or that? Right. Why should I study for this exam I have in two weeks? Because Christ is going to come back. Right. And of course, if we lived like that, we would be where would our <laughs> we would be doing that on everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was Paul's whole point. And in fact, though we don't know, so I want to be careful to read in the scripture. Right. Good. Good. Because we just stick with the text. But I could for I, I I can see this happening, and maybe it was happening among some in there in Thessalonica, where where the ones who took this tact, who said I'm not going to work, because you know Christ's coming back, where they actually were getting on the ones who were working and suggesting that they actually were godlier. Look at us; we're yeah. looking for Christ to come back. In fact. We're not working, so we can. The question is, we can eagerly await. Right his now, return. the question is, were those people like, you know, twenty four seven, on their knees praying with their eyes up? They were the to first heaven? monks. They were the first monks. Yeah, right. No, they, they <laughs> were. They were probably a lot of them sitting back in the original Lazy Boys, uh, brewing their own Martin Lutherish ancient beer and sitting back Great and juice. claiming, Great claim, yeah, claiming that they're you know waiting for the Lord and they're more godly, right? So, right, so all of that to say that we, we should care, and, and just out of obedience, mm-hmm. we should think through these things, and we should be active uh, in the public sphere, and that, uh, in, in the public square, uh, and, and in the sphere of political engagement as well. Yeah, for the good of our family, for the good of the right. gospel, right? Because like we were saying, does censorship have an impact on the spread of the gospel? Right. right, with the, the censoring, right. you know, the Twitter files that yeah. came out thanks to, you know, the purchase of what is now called X. Yeah. You know, do these sham trials in New York and Georgia and other places, do those, does that have an effect on the spread of the gospel? I mean, right. One would make the case that, yes, the silencing of truth in the public square means that if you were to say something against the regime, against the, the larger narrative, you're going to be cut off from being able to talk. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's where we have to distinguish, like, because there are some people that think, oh, well, if you're getting engaged in this and that, you, you're you're all about Donald Trump. You think he's your Messiah and this and that. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, yeah, that's definitely a criticism. Right, there certainly are some people out there that, you know, act like that. Every And you have that on both sides. Orange man saves. Ah, you have that it's on a, both sides, yeah, right? Yeah. You, you always have that, where you have some people that, you know, act like... Think Russell like, Moore is a savior. Yeah, <laughs> but, but they think whatever candidate's out there for whatever side they're for is somehow some sort of savior. We, we, look, we're fully aware. At least I am. I'm gonna, when I say well, we, I'm talking yeah. about you and me. Yes. Um, here at the Hammer Podcast. That's right. We're here fully aware. in the Hammer Podcast studio. We are fully aware... Uh, that no one is going to save us except the Lord Jesus Christ. And right. certainly not, you know, Donald Trump. So we're not and 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 the next series we do, which will kind of piggyback off of this, um but we'll we'll, we'll take it from here and be more specific and get ourselves into the the booth, mm. the voting booth. Now, back when I the you selection know, process. Yes, back when I first started voting, there was actual booth. I realize now you can just run down the road and Drop a box, drop a yeah, ballot and in drive, the box. You drop about 100 yeah. uh, ballots off. No one but, ever uh, did that. Stop. That that was never adjudicated in a court of law. Right, didn't those, those Zucker boxes <laughs> didn't really happen. <laughs> That's and, an uh, a figment of your uh, imagination. The footage there from Georgia with uh, inside with no one regulating and all the ballots were pulled out, that was... That was you an know, innocent water that leak. That was AI generated. Yeah, that was an innocent water leak. Oh, yeah, that water leak was yeah. that they had there was, was innocent. But... Yeah. All this being said, and of course we're having a little humor with it. Yes, yes. For those that don't know, that was sarcasm, friends. Yeah, and if you don't like any kind of humor, then this is not ever going to be the podcast for you. You can check out the Bill Gothard, I'm Right and Everyone's Wrong podcast. <laughs> uh, this is the Hammerhead <laughs> That's podcast. That's right. We're uh, here, here we believe in grace. That's right. Amen, amen. God's grace. Uh, it, yeah, so look, we know that that he, and so we're not, at least I'm certainly not. I'm not championing him. Yeah, as, right? a, we're, as we're, a savior. Right, right. We're talking about so. When, so when we talk about what you just mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, what's going on in the court system, mm-hmm. and how they're trying to railroad him. So we're not saying we're not out here saying all this like to support him specifically. We're talking about something much larger than one person. Mm-hmm. We're talking about that if you can do this to mm-hmm. one person, 
You can do it to the next person. Yeah, they come for him. And you can do it to the next person. That's you right. Can, I, I'll give you an example. So I was uh, in 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 Maryland this past weekend. Did they tax uh, you to drive in and drive out? Do you get taxed just being there? Uh, well, you know, I, I went to a car show, and it was a couple-day car show, and we do this annually with the family, and, and my dad has a couple hot rods, and, you know, we just, just have a good time. And, and uh, But, you know... I can tell you this: what I had to pay to to park one of the cars there was unbelievable. But that's beside the point. So, by uh, economics, but, but it's yeah, there, doing were, great for there were plenty of pl- plenty of taxes to go around there. Yeah, but so we're there, and and a news report came out, and I was like, "Yeah, you know, I'm so happy to be back in Maryland, you know, my home state." Uh, and I don't remember all the particulars, but basically a, a parent and, – and when I go away, I try to kind of disconnect a little bit, which means I don't really want to hear too much news because, you know um, – So you're not tried, looking at the stack from Citizens Kane. No. So I yeah. tried to disconnect and I tried to read through uh, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah to kind of get my mind working for coming up here on the fall. And, and you'll be hearing more about that, but – some some a lot of parallels there I think that we can make uh, in their time and our time but anyway so I so I heard Maryland just passed a law or something where parents so you send your child to public school you cannot opt out of the LGBTQ plus since training or whatever they do for the kids oh, you're not allowed. you can't you opt you out you cannot now opt out Wow. So it used to be sex education, right? Now yeah, they have yeah. the LGBTQ. I don't know exactly what they're calling it. But yeah. basically, they're, education. Yeah, sex education for— You can't. You can't. The, the high court of Maryland, right, ruled you cannot. I don't know which court. It might not have been Maryland Supreme Court. But it was. you cannot opt out. Now, I would hope and assume that's going to go up, maybe even to the Supreme Court, and that will be shot down. But, but the idea that now you're telling parents mm-hmm. that— you cannot opt your child out of this. That right. is unbelievable. But how did it get to that? Yeah. And and it may get to that in whatever state you, the believer, lives in. But I'll tell you this. I want to know that I've done what I can in a civil, biblical way mm-hmm. to combat that. Right. And if at the end of the day God allows that to happen, fine. But, but I want to know that I did something and not just sit back and say, well, you know— Okay, Sarah, Sarah, if God mm-hmm. was going to allow it. Again, I don't take that tack. I hope not, right, in my evangelism. Right. I certainly don't say, you know, I'm not going to eat. I mean, I'll die when God wants me to die. I'm just not going to eat. <laughs> yeah. week later, yeah, die you know, I'm starvation. not going to go to work because, you know, the Brinks truck will just break down the front of my house and a couple God bags will, will fall out. God will provide, right? So we, we don't live our lives like that in any other area, I hope. There right. are some people that... Lazy bums that do that, but right. uh, anyway, so so that's I mean, but but that's just another example, you know. Right. So so we should be again in, engaged, and and it's not about one person. Uh, well, for us, it is right, Jesus Christ. Yes, but the point is not about one political per- right. This is about this is much larger than than Donald Trump mm-hmm. or the Republican Party or the MAGA or the ultra MAGA or whatever other. Uh, Christian, yeah, and they've got, yeah. I mean, you've got all kinds of <laughs> you know stuff now, and and a hundred different definitions for Christian nationalism, right? But anyway, don't scare our listeners. That word is scary. That's right. Apparently, it is for some. <laughs> to some, to David French, yeah, yeah, to David French. You know, this reminds me as we talk about some of these things. This episode has been brought to you by the truth. You can't play hide and seek with it nice nice yeah so anyway so but that that's been the whole point is just trying to get get to here think through these things everyone ultimately has to make you know their own decision Mm -hmm. um and let god guide them you know we we just want to help them think through this and try to use the bible properly or at least not improperly. Yeah, at least not improperly. As, as they think through this, right? Well, and I think one of the other things that's interesting is that some of the people that are resisting any kind of public square cultural engagement, right? Yes. They have what I like to call a martyr complex. And so they've they've convinced themselves 
that if they are being persecuted by the government and the culture, yeah. that somehow they're, they have like a higher spiritual status, right? Because they're in this persecuted martyr, you know, martyrism deal. And so they yeah. don't want to say, hey, hold on. Parents have the authority by God to bring their children up in whatever fashion they want. So the government can't just come and take away a right yeah. that God gave to them. They say, no, that's not our fight, not our kingdom. If we get oppressed, the gospel will spread to the blood of the martyrs. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to say that I would, I would agree with you that there are people out there with that mindset. I, I'm certainly not, and I'm not saying you are, but I want to clarify for listeners. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, please do. That everyone, that all the believers that might be considered apolitical, we're not saying they all think like that. Yes, amen. But, I would agree. But they I don't think a lot think. of them do. Yeah, I, well, we certainly talked to some that do, and yeah. and hopefully anyone who did have that that would listen to what we've been saying, hopefully, you know, will we'll think about it and at least consider what we're saying. Uh, again, you know, everybody's going to have to do what they think is right, you know, before the Lord on this, because you'll answer for the Lord how you acted. Mm-hmm. I'll answer for how I acted, right? So. Um, we, we've got that concept of the priesthood of, right. of all believers. Um, we're not telling you what to do, how to do it. Uh, so we each have to figure that out. But but to your point, I, I think that's wrong-headed. And, and tell us why, and I know you would agree with that, so what problems would you have with that mindset? Yeah, well, I think so, you know, to the un... Right, to a believer that's like new to Christianity, they just started reading their Bible, you know, they're hearing stuff talk about how the early church, they were persecuted, they were martyred, the gospel advanced through their Mm -hmm. martyrdom. I can see how it would be attractive to say, yes, yes, see, God always advances his truth, even when his people are being persecuted. Right. Because he does. Right, like God in the end doesn't lose, he always wins. But... To, to convince yourself that persecution is better than the free ability to proclaim and preach God's word, I think is misguided, because you look at what, we, yep. what we've said, you know, since the birth of the United States, you know, how many missionaries, how many Bibles have been translated, right? how, many, how many churches have been planted and people have been saved because of the ability here yeah. to have the freedom to speak truth, right? We have the freedom to speak our ideas, right? Our ideas, because they're gods, happen to be truth. Yeah. But it's the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, right? So once you start tamping down on that, you look at Soviet, you know, during the Cold War behind the, the Iron Curtain. Right. You, you know, the spread of the gospel was advancing there in some ways, but it was going slow, and it was stifled, and it was... It was, you know, very segregated. But then when the Iron Curtain came down and freedom was allowed to have more space, shall we say, not free reign, but at least more space, churches in the Eastern Bloc started to, to go and grow everywhere. Uh, you know, so it, yeah. it just it seems misguided that we would have this martyr complex and think that the only way the gospel can advance is through persecution. Yes, the gospel will advance through persecution, but that doesn't mean that we need to cut off our nose to spite our face. Yeah. Right? And we live in a country where for the the time being, and it might be a short time because, you know, depending on how things break, we are in a fourth turning. Okay? And so there's a lot of forces arrayed against Western civilization. And so if things break in a certain direction, all those freedoms are going to get shut down like they did on Twitter, like they do on Facebook, like they do yeah, on YouTube, that's right. like well, they do in the courtroom. Yeah. You know, and so we have a chance to say, no, we're going to stand up for the freedom of speech because it's God's given us that right. right. As individuals, it's not government decreed, it's God yeah. given. Uh, or we can just kind of duck and run and say, no, no, the gospel will be better off under persecution. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and I think just look at... Um, if, if my mind serves me correctly, which it doesn't always, somewhere in 1922, right? Uh, early 20s. I want to say 22, but the, the Soviet Union was technically formed. Um, 
So just just take from 1922. Right. Take the United States, take the Soviet Union. We've had, let's just say, in the last hundred years. Yeah. Where has the church thrived more? You say, well, there's more heresy in the United States. Well, yeah, because you've got this freedom, right? Mm-hmm. But who have sent who sent out more missionaries? Right. What society's better for it, right? So, um, so there's an example. Yeah. Right. So, so the point is that oppression it does. It, we shouldn't be uh, seeking it. Right. Now. It will, it will come anyway, I, if, if my reading of Scripture is correct. Again, I'm not post-millennialist. I think it's going to come anyway. We're seeing it happen in our nation right now, right? Right. So, you know, so we don't... Because if, in fact, oppression and persecution uh, is like a catalyst, for the, then that should be part of our strategy, right? Right. We should be doing what we can to be persecuted and everything, because that will, right. you know, get the gospel out more. So, no, now, does God's word, uh, can God do what he did in the book of Acts? Of course. Right. But there again is where we have to remember that in our situation, living in a republic, mm-hmm. we, we can't go back and, and look at Paul and, and uh, any of the apostles and, and, and make a straight line Right and say, well, you know, we've seen everything they're doing, so then we're doing it because, and so then therefore we should do this. They didn't live in a republic, mm-hmm. right? right? So, so therefore, there are going to be some nuances that are a little bit different. Yeah, it's not apples to apples when right. you make the comparison, right? But as we've said before, you know, Paul absolutely when he needed to, hey, I'm a Roman citizen. I yeah. just want you to know that before you beat me. Yeah, uh, because according to the written law, you're not supposed to do that, right? So. Um, and we've talked about all that. So, well, I think, you know, okay, let's go back to the Reformation for a second. Yeah. You know, our hammerheads might be those that love the Reformation, but prior to, um, you know, prior to Martin Luther, yes, and doing the ninety-five thesis, Rome was on a crusade to silence any opposition. Right? They had a, a stranglehold on the narrative, right? And so. Without and, and so there was no freedom to say anything other than what they wanted it to be, and they were making money hand over fist. And then all of a sudden, out of that darkness, birthed the light of the Reformation, and there became all across Europe yeah. f- this this desire and appetite for free thought and free thinking when it came to what does the Bible say, what is the world, who is God, right. how does all this work? And so you saw churches thrive and people you know countless people getting saved because of that freedom right but it took a few men saying hey enough's enough the censorship of truth is not good we want to have freedom of speech and so they stood up for that yeah yeah no it's a good point and i think just to kind of kind of bring us to a close here i I think we can take everything we've talked about for instance and just kind of go back and, and put ourselves in Nazi Germany. Mm-hmm. Let's just plant ourselves in Germany, we'll say, in 1925. Yes, you know, yes. Let, let's say all of our hammerheads are listening. Let's just say all of us are, I'll just pick a number 30. We're 30 years old in 1925. Okay? Now, if you know your years, you realize Hitler has not come to power yet, but but he's about to, right? So we're seeing things in our culture, and, and so... Are you what? What tact are you going to take? Are you going to do something? Mm-hmm. Or are you just going to sit back and do nothing? Right now, I think most of our hammerheads are listening, saying, "Well, no, I want to. I, I want to do something. I don't want to not do nothing." Now, of course, they weren't. They didn't have a republic. Right. Right. So we have to remember that nuance. But I think most of our hammerheads, no, no, I, I want to do something. Well, there are a lot of people that did nothing. I'm talking about professing believers. Yeah, right. And then, of course, we have Bonhoeffer as—he's not the only one. He's the most notable example, but certainly not the only one that did something. So I think most of the hammerheads would say, well, I want to do something, but I don't know that I want to get a gun and seek out Hitler and blow his head off. Mm -hmm. Some might want to. Um, But— Many of our hammerheads are saying, you know, okay, I don't want to—I know I shouldn't go that far. That was a little dramatic, right? A little Uh, dramatic. But on the other hand, I don't want to do nothing. Okay, so 
what do I do then? And and then taking it to our day and age. Yeah. Uh, and being a republic and the right to vote and so forth, right? So what, what do we do? Well, yeah. that'll be kind of our extension, which is kind of a new series, but certainly related to everything we've talked about in this series. And, and that'll be coming up soon as we prepare uh, for the next election. Yes, that's right. That's right. Okay, Snurdly's got me here. The Hammerheads are want us to continue, but friends, our time is running short. So we're going to turn into our vault. And, you know, we actually... Speaking of future series, we're going to take a, a week or two to go through the vault because we have so many questions. We can't actually, haven't been able to get a new vault in, so we can't, you know, we don't have room. So we're going to sort through some of the questions um, in the vault and answer those for you, our faithful, beloved hammerheads, next week and the week here to come. So, but but we have one question that we would like to answer as I turn into the vault. Let me, oh, yep, oh, okay, well, all right, good, I've got it here. I have it here Watch in that my... Door. Watch it, latch the door. Whoa, whoa, oh, okay. There's I... a lot of, a lot of questions, a lot of stuff's falling out, latch that door. Yeah, all right, we've got it, it's latched up now. All right. So I have here in my formerly East Coast wing stained fingers, the Inquisition. Should a pastor step down if his children are disobedient. Hmm. Should a pastor step down if his... Wait a minute. If his children are, are you, disobedient. Are you making an accusation against my children? Well... Is that what's happening here? I didn't write this, but there might be some in the, the Inquisition that could be. Is that it, anonymous? Well, I've, yes, it is anonymous, but we could do our handwriting... Well, none of our hammerheads would ask that question targeting me. Well, I mean, you do live in a fishbowl, though, right? A knucklehead might do that. Oh, yes. That's um, right. The knuckleheads are always out yes. there trying to cause That's problems. Right. Now, should have passed. Well, you know what? That that actually is a, a legitimate question and a good question. Scripture does address it. The thing is, though, there are several nuances there that it would be impossible for me, that this would have to be a longer discussion to really get into the nuances. I can only answer by saying that yes, there is, there are biblical parameters to to where there does get to be a point uh, where uh, that that should take place, right? Um, where a pastor can be, well, let's just put it this way: he can be disqualified uh, at least for a period of time. Um, from pastoring uh, any elder, mm-hmm. right? Um, based on the conduct of their children, but then there are a bunch of nuances. That Lots would, of nuances that would be for uh, another day and another time to really answer that. You know, clearly, I, I would just say to each person, um, we always want to make sure we're very, very gracious and loving. And and not just simply accusatory, so we want to be very careful with right. that. I would I wouldn't want anyone to ever hear this and then take it and say I'm going to go into the pastor at my church or whatever. Or I'm going to go into the next you know this or that and meeting and bring this up, mm-hmm. right? So um, yeah, we want to we want to extend grace upon grace. Right, uh, because the pastor's children do not have to be sinless, right? Uh, so anyway, so yeah, that would be uh, that. That would be the most I could say about it in this setting. But it is. It, I mean, it is a good question. Is know? there so as we close? Is yeah. there a distinction between a five-year-old child, a sixteen-year-old child, and a twenty-five-year-old child? Yeah, well, yeah. Once they're you know, and, and certainly in our culture, I mean, once they're 18 and, and, and you know, out of high school and such, I, I yeah, would suggest it, that, that that's, you're in a different sphere. But again, that's why we would have to talk yeah, about Yeah, there's the nuances. nuance. There's a lot are of nuances Are they still living under your house? What are you tolerating? What are you not? What are they doing? What are they not? All of that. Yeah. Well, good. So, the hammerheads are going to just have to wait on pins yeah, and needles. But that's a good, I mean, it, it's a good question, yeah. you know? See, our hammerheads are are the highest caliber of listeners That's in the right. podcast world. That's, That's why right. they ask the best questions. Borderline genius, if you ask me. Borderline genius. That's all, friends. We will see you 
in 168 hours. hours.